Thank you, U.S. Congressman G.K. Butterfield. The month of March is National Women's History Month, a time to reflect on the pioneers who have broken down barriers, created new opportunities, and championed justice, and risked their lives for the greater good. Some are household names like Harriet Tubman, who guided more than 300 slaves to freedom on the Underground Railroad. And Betsy Ross, we all know that name, Betsy Ross, who created our nation's most cherished symbol, the American flag. However, these women are joined by so many more who are groundbreakers and inspire the leaders of the future. And I am joined today by our Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Dr. Hayden was sworn in as our 14th Librarian of Congress in 2016. Dr. Hayden has her own space in American history. She is the first, she is the first woman and the first African-American woman uh, to hold this office. Thank you for joining me today, Dr. Hayden. Uh, thank you for your reception and your graciousness and, and your willingness to host us uh, for these few moments in your office. Uh, Dr. Hayden, you came into your office at a very pivotal time in our nation's history. Tell me a little bit about that. I know you're the first African-American to hold this position and the first woman to hold this position, but tell us about the very moment that you came into this office and the challenges that we were facing as a country. It's significant that I'm the first African-American because I am descended from a people who were denied the right to read. And so that was something that I talked about at my swearing and how significant that was. Also to be the first woman for, uh, since 1802, there have been 14 librarians of Congress and only one woman. And librarianship is one of four feminized professions where 85% of the workforce is female. However, the top management or the people in charge are um, often male. The aspect that also is significant is that libraries are seen as the bastion of accurate information, keepers of history. And at this time in our nation's history, when people are looking backward to look forward, being in a library, and a library that's the world's largest, is something that I think has even more significance. You know, I often tell the story in some of my speeches as I give them throughout the country. Uh, in 1831, in my state of North Carolina, and I'm sure it was true in other states, state legislatures made it a crime to teach slaves to read and write. Yes. And the punishment uh, for offending that particular law was 39 lashes on your back. And so reading and writing has been, been a source of conversation in the African-American community for many years because it was a crime uh, to teach slaves to read and write. And it also created uh, a tension in many communities, especially on plantations. Imagine an older slave seeing a younger slave trying to learn to read and knowing that in some states you could also have a hand amputated. That even so you're, you have the tension of the generation saying don't do that don't don't try to learn to read and that legacy of having a conflicted relationship with literacy has been looked at as something that has affected the african-american efforts with education and this push and pull really but notwithstanding the law, there was still a, a great movement in the South to teach the slaves to read yes. and write. But it was an underground movement. Uh, free people of color uh, uh, tried their best to teach slaves uh, quietly uh, how to read and write. And even a few whites uh, did that in, in their own way. Yes, Frederick Douglass in his autobiography talks about that aspect. And he said that he knew that reading was important if his slave master didn't want him to do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And the slave master's wife uh, you know, serendipitously tried to, to teach him, and he said, once you learn to read, you'll be forever free. That's right. And it's so ironic that 70 years later, the same state legislatures that made it a crime to teach slaves to read and write, now made reading and writing a prerequisite to voting. Yes. 
Yeah. Well, and that you know, gets like, into yes, the yes. push and pull. And yes. that's why history is so important when it, we look to the past to see what we can do in the present and plan for the future. Tell me very uh, briefly, if you can, uh, Dr. Hayden, just, just what do you do here at the Library of Congress? Oh. Uh, how, how massive is your workforce here? And, <laughs> and just what do you and your staff do every day? And I have to, yeah. I, I smile because I must tell you, it's a wonderful, wonderful adventure, especially for someone who's a career librarian. Uh, we get to look at and try to interpret and bring to the public over 162 million items that range from comic books to manuscripts of famous people to recordings and films. And as Librarian of Congress, I get to work with very knowledgeable people who are interpreting the material and saying, here's how we can bring it to everyone. And that's what we are responsible for. We also work with the creative community in terms of the copyright process to make sure people know about protecting their creations. And so we are also working on having exhibits, for instance, to go throughout the country. And even an 18-wheeler that we're going to pull up in mm -hmm. the communities mm -hmm. and bring library on the move. So Are any of these manuscripts digitized? So yes, the can quite see a few. Yes. For instance, the Rosa Parks papers were just digitized. And that's a wonderful collection that people can see just at their fingertips. And are you open on weekends for public tours? We're open on tours? Saturdays, yes. and we are also open for young people. We have a Young Reader Center starting from zero all the way to 16, and we have programming, and we are really excited about and that. And for someone from North Carolina, if they came up for a tour on a Saturday oh, morning, they would have where, a would they, where would they start? Oh, they would start right at the Jefferson Building, and they could see one of the most beautiful buildings in Washington, D.C., and then they would be taken on a tour to see the Gutenberg Bible. They would see Thomas Jefferson's uh, library. They would see a magnificent reading room. And then if they had any special interests, like North Carolina, our curators would bring out materials, historic materials about North Carolina. You know, I was a judge in my former life, and people ask me all the time, what one case do I remember the most and, 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 and recognize uh, as the most valuable in my work? And I'm going to turn that around in your work. What exhibit and what collection here in the library, if you can identify one, that resonates the most with you? I mentioned yeah. the Rosa Parks collection because I get a chance, and now everyone gets a chance to see in her own handwriting what she felt about being arrested. And she said, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I felt like a nobody. And that really resonates because you think of young people today that are having these different feelings. And to see what, uh, what they think of as an icon now put in her own hands. She also said something as she was working on our autobiography about how much do I tell? What would people think if I told the truth? And that's something I think that resonates with each other. Yeah, I'm sure there are other African American women that, that you admire from years uh, Oh, uh, Mary, Mary McLeod Bethune, Bethune, I would think. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. I have a yeah. sketch of her in my office, and there are a number of Eleanor Roosevelt, I yes. went to Roosevelt University, yes. and yes. she helped found that, it was all founded on public service, and she did so much in terms of helping. Yes. Uh, the I'm told that, that Eleanor Roosevelt and Mary McLeod Bethune had a bond of friendship. Yes, they did, and yes. they plotted and planned together, too, yes. and that yes. just, uh, it's fun to read about them working together to make sure things happen. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, made sure that she flew with one of the Tuskegee Airmen to show mm -hmm. uh, her confidence in mm -hmm. their mm -hmm. abilities. That's very powerful. Dr. Hayden, I want to thank you for the high honor of joining me today and just having this conversation with you. It's one of the joys of, of my life. We've been, we've been blessed, so blessed to have you as our nation's chief librarian. And so we celebrate you and we celebrate this nation's uh, a moment in history and women leaders as we go through the month of March and, and try to take this message across the country. 
so that every man, woman, and child in America knows the contributions that, of, of women and the role that they've played in the development of our great country. Thank, Thank you. you so very much. Thank you for having me. Bless you. All right.